Well, good evening. Welcome to a, welcome to another meeting tonight. And if you're wondering date stamp, today is October the 26th, Monday. So if you're watching online and I say welcome to October 24, you're watching the wrong day. <laughs> Go back and you'll find today. I know they're all listed there. We want to welcome everybody again out tonight. Well, it was a joy when my wife and I got married. We took a call immediately to Burma. We had a mission school there called Corinne Adventist Academy. The school took tuition in rice and the parents would bring in their huge kilo sacks of rice to pay their tuition. But the curries which went on the rice was always in short supply. And it was always a struggle for me when I would, they only had two meals a day. That's all the kids were fed there at the school. I was just a teacher, a new missionary. But they would come to me and they would say, Tara, that was uh, the, the title for pastor teacher. We, we don't have any curry tonight. And they would always send the same girl because she was always successful. <laughs> They say, it was like, you know, go tell Tara, we don't really have anything tonight. And every time she came and told me, she knew that I wouldn't send her back hungry. And we always managed somewhere to get the food. And eventually we got the farm up and going. And that was really a big relief. We had the students that labored, lots of hoes, lots of sunshine, year round sunshine. They built um, a, a dam up in a waterfall with a four inch pipe that brought water down and we were able to fill a, a Noah's Ark wooden tank with tar that would fill up high and gravity feed hoses down in the watering cans during the dry season. And I remember always the students after school would go out and work. And we had uh, uh, broccoli and they call it I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> you know, one bean fills a whole can. <laughs> but uh, they were a pole bean, so we'd get bamboo slices and they'd grow up high and seven, eight foot, and then the beans would come down. And it was always nice that when the kids could say, Thera, we have no food. I'd say, let's go to the garden. You guys have been working. And today I think there's just some eggplant we could put in the, in the curry dish. Or we have, you know, some onions and some green beans. We can make a curry. And the kids would be able to get some food and, and eat. And that was always a happy time. I never liked to know that children were hungry. And I'm looking forward to heaven. Amen. Yeah. When we'll have eternal life and we'll be able to eat freely of the tree of life. And never again will there be a hungry child or anybody that goes to bed without a meal. And so I want to give the Lord Jesus thank you for uh, the beautiful blessings that he's given to us in this land. That We all had breakfast today. And nobody is going hungry because of a, a wonderful country that God has truly blessed here in our United States of America. A couple things tonight if you're watching online. 
This Friday we have a special message. Mike will tell you more about the upcoming meetings. But Friday we have a special message. And we want to encourage you to come Friday night for, for being our visitors here. We have a final events of Bible prophecy by Doug Batchelor. And this is a dramatic event. It's got acting. It's got Bible prophecy. It's got little clips in there of how things would be. Uh, time of trouble clips in there and then prophecies explanation of things. Um, in uh, 2006 Doug Batchelor and I went to India. We held evangelistic meetings and uh, they're among the untouchable people. And he's the host and speaker of this final event. So you really will enjoy it. And we have uh, some for each for our visitors to come. So Friday night you don't want to miss. And if you're watching online and you want to get something about that, let us know. Mike will give you his email address a little later. We're taking questions and we're also wanting to have you let us know if you like the literature. We have some literature we're passing out here at the meetings. Some of you might have missed and you're watching. We could either mail it to you or just hang it on your, no, nah, we won't knock on your house or anything like that because it's COVID. We'll just leave it there. If you see it outside and you, it's hanging there, you know it's from us. But maybe just a smile face or something. It's just dropping it off because we want you to be able to have the literature even though you're watching online. You don't feel left out because we're actually having more online than there's many of them to come to the meetings, which is a wonderful thing. I noticed one was in Alaska. Somebody's in Alaska and watching there. So we have people from all over the world uh, watching my, our meetings here. I'll turn them over to uh, Gary. There's another advantage in being here in that you folks that are here have a, we have a drawing every night and you can win those prizes. So uh, we're giving away two beautiful uh, devotionals tonight. One is entitled, I Am Loved. And the other one is called Jesus, the name above all names. So those will be our two drawings tonight. And uh, let's do that right away. I got two, whoops, no, I only have one. You only have one? Yeah. That one was too good. <laughs> <laughs> there, thank you very much, Diana. Jeff Harth, what? <laughs> I tell you what, that is amazing. And uh, Kathy Harth, how does that happen? <laughs> Well, okay. No, I, I'm comfortable with that. If everybody else is, give someone else a chance. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Jesse Prill. There you go. Uh, pick these up right on the in the back, and. Uh, I hope you enjoy those books as much, uh, oh, enjoy them as much as I had fun picking them out for you. Um, I just want to share another thought too, is that how much we uh, appreciate those who, who have placed an offering into the offering plate to help us cover the expenses of this series of meetings. We appreciate your kindness in doing that. Um, and don't forget to fill out uh, the uh, any questions you might have for Mike. Uh, and just a reminder that there are some cards uh, in the pews, those little white cards. And if you're listening and you don't totally understand something that came out of Mike's mouth, write it down on your on your uh, piece of paper and uh, give it to him so that he'll have a chance to uh, uh, share the answer with you. Let's pray at this time and ask God to be with us. Father, thank you so much that we have the privilege of being here tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would open our, our minds and help our ears to work well tonight, that we might listen well, and that we might apply the truth that we hear from your word tonight to our hearts, that we might have a character more like Jesus Christ. 
And as we are blessed, I pray that we would be a blessing to others. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe tonight that Aaron Rose has the special music. And so he's a man of many, many talents. And in addition to playing uh, with electronics back there, he also plays a violin. Good evening. Glad to see you here tonight. Um, this is the fourth night of the meetings. And I'd like to say that if you'll stick with me, if you'll stick with these meetings for at least two weeks, if you'll stick around for two weeks, at the end of the two weeks, I'm going to give you the DVD on Daniel 2. Each one of you sticks it out for at least two weeks. doesn't have to be every night. If you have to miss a night, that's okay. But just stick with me for two, a couple weeks here. And uh, hopefully all the way to the end. But if you stick with me for the two weeks, I'm going to give you the Daniel 2 DVD. Um, I'm going to give you Daniel verse by verse, Revelation verse by verse, and... A book called War and Revelation, which I wrote. And it's my meetings. But I can't give you the book now because then you'll just stay home and read the book and you won't come to my meetings. So, uh, we want to offer these gifts to you. Um, if you'll stick it out for a couple weeks, I'll just give them to you. That's why we're, we're not going to... We're not going to draw them off anymore because we want to give them to you free if you just keep coming. Okay? Well, good evening. It's getting a little colder outside. My wife isn't even here tonight because she worked outside painting all day, and she is cold and wants to warm up and get some sleep. <laughs> um, tonight, we did have a question. Can you please explain more about Hebrews 6 and how, why, and how and why that is proof that it is possible to be lost after you are saved? Are there any other verses that support this idea? 
Um, I didn't want to give you the wrong impression last night when we talked about Hebrews 6, but I will explain it. And I will also state that most of the scripture is very positive about those who accept Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. Amen? Very positive. But there are some challenges. Hebrews 6, 4 says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. That means they knew the truth. And have tasted of the heavenly gift. It means they accepted the Holy Spirit. And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Spirit dwelt in them. And have tasted the good word of God. And the powers of the world to come. They were overcomers. They were in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ was in them. This is describing a converted person. He was enlightened, had the Holy Spirit dwelling in him, and was part of God's kingdom according to this passage. But the scripture goes on, If they shall fall away, to renew them again to repentance. This is referring to those who had salvation and turned away from it. Had it, lost it. In Mark 4, 14 through 19, Jesus tells the parable of the sower and the soil. He said the word sowed in the wayside, after they hear, Satan takes away the word sown in their heart immediately. So maybe people heard it, but they didn't really respond to it because Satan took it away right away. Stony ground, they receive salvation with gladness, but they have no root in themselves and endure for a time. They're in the church. They've accepted Jesus. They're following him and his way. But when affliction or persecution arise, they are offended. They had it, and they lost it. Those among the thorns receive salvation, but the worries of the world and riches and lust choke the word and becomes unfruitful. Had it, lost it. Luke eleven twenty four. Jesus told another parable about a man with an unclean spirit, and the unclean spirit left. Now, why would the unclean spirit leave a man when he's already there? Yeah, he was saved. We can only get cleansed by receiving Jesus Christ and washing away our sins. So that evil spirit was kicked out, and he left. But what happened? Verse 25, and when he, the unclean spirit, comes back, and what does he find? He finds the house empty, swept, and garnished. It's clean, but it's empty. What isn't there? The Holy Spirit. So that person was washed and cleansed by Jesus, but the Holy Spirit didn't stay. Because there's no guarantee that the Holy Spirit's going to stay when he comes in to dwell in you. Jesus said, we will come and make our abode in you. You know, the Holy Spirit is not in every person. The Holy Spirit is working on people from the outside. But we have to invite him in. And once he comes in, he drives the demons out. But they don't go away either. They're on the outside still trying to get back in again. There's a war over the human mind, amen? If we don't have the Spirit of God in us, we are none of his, Romans 8, 9. We have to have the Spirit of God in order to be Jesus's. Because why? The Holy Spirit can be grieved, and it can be blasphemed. Then he, go, then he goes and takes seven other demons more wicked than himself, and they enter in and live there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Wow. It's better for him not to have ever gotten cleaned than to get cleaned and then lose it. Paul wrote in Romans eleven twenty three, 23, but toward you goodness, if, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you shall also be what? Cut off, lost. He writes in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul's saying, I have it. I don't want to lose it. I could lose it. So I keep my body under subjection. Well, what's he referring to? He was referring back to 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. It says, Know you not that you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. That's not being saved, is it? 
For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. So we are to be holy people, so the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Can the Holy Spirit dwell in an unholy person? No. Well, how are we holy? By the presence of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit dwells in you, you are holy. That means you've given your control over to Jesus, and He reigns in your heart. 2 Peter 2, 19 through 22, while they promised them liberty. Now here's people that claim you're free in Jesus. You're free from the law. You're free from sin. You can go ahead and do whatever you want to. No, that's not what it means. They themselves are the ser servants of what? Corruption. They think they're free from the law, so they go ahead and break it. That means they're servants of sin. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought into bondage. Jesus came to set us free from bondage to what? To sin and death. <clears throat> For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein. That's the person who was saved and loses it. And overcome, the latter end is worse with them at the beginning, which we just talked about in a previous parable. But it has happened according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his old vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Had it, lost it. Because they promised them liberty from sin, but continued in it, there has to be a change. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. 2 John 9, whosoever transgresses, that's sin, and abides not in the doctrine of Christ, has not God. You have to follow his teachings. You know, the devils believe and tremble. That doesn't mean they're saved. There has to be an obedience. And the devils didn't believe, they, they believed Jesus is God, but they didn't obey him. People claim to be Christian and saved, but they don't think, act, and live like a Christian ought to according to the Bible. We are to abide in Christ's doctrine or teachings. Ezekiel 18, 21 through 27 makes it pretty clear. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he has committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. There's a change, right? Change in mind, change of heart, change in attitude, change in actions. All his transgressions he has committed, they shall not be mentioned to him in his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked shall die? saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live. But there's another scenario. But when the righteous turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? In his righteousness that he has done shall not be mentioned. You have an outstanding citizen in the community, a doctor. He's done many wonderful things. He's brought babies into the world. He saved people's lives through his medicine. And then he goes out and kills his wife. Is he going to go into the court of law and say, Judge, I'm a good person. I've saved lots of lives. I brought a lot of babies into the world. Let me go. What is the judge going to say? Guilty. In his trespass that he has trespassed, and in his sin that he has sinned, in them he shall what? Die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Here now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? God wants to save people. He doesn't want to destroy them. But we can't take him for granted. 1 John 1, 9 is the key we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from how much unrighteousness? All. That means you're clean. But what is the prerequisite? Confession. we got to be sorry for our sins. Not confessing is refusing the promptings of the Holy Spirit, which comes to reprove the world of sin. He comes into our heart and says, you're doing something wrong. You shouldn't talk like that. Okay. So Peter starts cursing and swearing. You shouldn't be drinking that. People stop drinking. You shouldn't be putting that in your mouth and smoking it. People stop doing that. But then you say, well, I hate my brother. Well, what does Jesus say about hating your brother? If you don't forgive him, 
God can't forgive you. How can you say you love God and hate your brother? How can you say you love God which you haven't seen, but you hate your brother which you have seen? Said so it's not right. You can't do that. So he says, Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked shall die, saith the Lord God, not that he should return from his ways and live? And blaspheming the Holy Spirit basically is refusing to listen to the Spirit when he tells you you're doing something wrong and you refuse to be sorry for it. That's the only God, that's the only sin God can't forgive. David committed murder and adultery, and he confessed, and God forgave him. Those aren't the unpardonable sins. You might have done something terrible and think, God can never forgive me. That's not true. If you confess and repent, he forgives you. The only sin he can't forgive is the one you refuse to confess, the one you refuse to be sorry for, the one that you cling to and won't let go of. That's the sin God can't forgive. Because he wants to, but you refuse to confess. You refuse to submit. And that's the unpardonable sin, and that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. All right, I hope that answered your question. Okay. Tonight we want to look at the, what the Bible says about why things are so messed up. There are warning lights flashing in the book of Revelation. They're telling us now that behind the scenes there is danger. Remember we said the book of Revelation is about Jesus Christ and 300 verses are about Jesus in the first three chapters or something like that? But it's also a warning we read in the book of Revelation about an omnious power that will come and bring spiritual distress to planet Earth. We also see that the battle of Armageddon will take place and the seven last plagues will fall upon the Earth. So what's really going on behind the scenes? We don't want to go blissfully about our business when there's a squadron of attack planes bearing down on you and bringing death, as in the beginning of World War II. In the beginning, God created a perfect world, and he populated it with two perfect people. Yet when he created them, he said it's very good. There was no sin, there was no death, no disease, no debt, no depression, no divorce, and no deception. But sin came, and it originated in the most unlikely of all places. The Bible says that long ago, there was war in heaven. Understanding how that could happen will help us to come to grips with why there's death and sickness and sadness and sorrow in our world today. And it will help us understand the important prophecies of the Bible. While most of us have never been caught up in the heat of a battle, the war that began in heaven has spread to earth and it involves all of us. Revelation 12, 7 through 9 says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, that was the devil's angels, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. They were kicked out of heaven. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. Jesus, as I beheld Satan, fall like lightning from the sky, or from heaven. And he deceives what? Say it again. The whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Satan deceived one third of all the angels in heaven. Now the good news is that two thirds of the angels stuck with God. One third of them rebelled against God and followed Satan. He's a deceiver, a master deceiver where he could lie and get one third of the angels in heaven to turn against God. How effective do you think he could be with us? Revelation 12, 4 says, His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Well, we know the stars of heaven were the angels. But I've been trying to imagine in my mind a dragon's tail knocking all these angels out of heaven. But Isaiah 9, 15 gives us a clue. The ancient and honorable, he is the head. The prophet that teaches lies, he is the what? 
He's the tail. So it was the devil's lies that drew one third of the angels in heaven out of heaven. He lied to them and they followed him. He believed him. Why was there war in heaven and how does it affect us? And what does an angel have to do with our to get kicked out of God's house? <laughs> what happened to Lucifer that caused him to go bad? Let's find out what the Bible tells us. Isaiah chapter 14 contains these words. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the furthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Satan wanted to be God. Now, how could a created being want to be the creator? It's unreal. As incredible as it sounds, an angel declared he wanted to sit in God's place. The one we call Satan was created by God as a beautiful angel, a privileged angel. The Word of God described him as a covering cherub who dwelled in the presence of God. He was not only beautiful, he was perfect. And he was evidently also very musical. You see, God didn't create a devil. He made a beautiful angel. And he was very musical because Ezekiel 28, 13 says, The workness up of your tabrets and of your pipes was prepared in you in the day that you were created. Tabrets represents musical instruments, and his pipes is his vocal cords or his singing voice. So Satan is a very good musician and a very good singer. Do you think he can use music to lead people away from God? Hmm. The devil wanted to be in God's place. He did not want to be subordinate. He wanted to be superior. He wanted leadership and rulership. What Satan wanted was worship. He wanted to be somebody he was not and was never intended to be. He came to the place that he wanted to receive worship. The reason that impacts us today is because if you look in the book of Revelation, you will discover that the key issue confronting human beings down in the end of time is the issue of worship. Let's look at Revelation 13, 1 through 3. It says, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And on his horns, ten crowns. That not, kind of sounds like Daniel 7, doesn't it? With the fourth beast with ten horns. Remember that? Rome. And on his head's a blasphemous name. It says, then I... Okay. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. Who did the leopard represent in Daniel 7? Greece. His feet were like the feet of a bear. Who was that? Media Persia. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Who is that? Babylon. Babylon with lion with eagle's wings, remember? And the dragon, who is the fourth beast of Daniel 7? Rome. But the power behind these beasts is who? Satan. God had a people. He picked out a group of people called the Jews or the Hebrews. And each one of these kingdoms are mentioned in the Bible because they came in contact with Israel, and they conquered them. And so they are mentioned, and these are the four world empires that ruled the earth. So the dragon, Rome, gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. So they're really getting their power and their throne and their great authority from who? From Satan. And I saw one of his heads that were mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed after the beast. Now notice what the next verse says. So they worshipped the beast. Who were they worshipping? Satan. See, that's what it is right there. Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Late in earth's history, the key spiritual issue will focus around worship, and Satan will receive the worship of the world. He wanted worship in heaven, but not able to achieve all he wanted. He sets his sights on this world. Paul called Satan the prince of the power of the air. Jesus told Peter, Satan has desired to have you. Jesus told him he was going to go to the cross and die 
and be resurrected the third day. And Peter says, oh, let this not happen to you, Jesus. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, talking to Peter. Why? Because it was God's plan that Jesus die for our sins. And Peter was saying, no, that's not, let's not go there. That's not the plan we want. Now, they wanted him to be king right away and kill the Romans. That's not what he came for. And out in the wilderness, Satan claimed the kingdoms of this world and everything in them as his very own. Worship in heaven didn't happen, so he came down here to the earth trying to gain control of the world. Does it look like Satan has been trying to gain control of this world? Does it look like he's had any success? There's no question. In which direction is the world heading? If we want to be honest, we're not trending downwards. We're plummeting downwards. In Luke 10, verse 18, Jesus said, I beheld Satan like lightning fall from heaven. This world is now humanistic and secular and skeptical and full of doubt. More people than ever are living without reference to God. And you'll hear many people say, I'm a spiritual person rather than a committed Christian. Coincidence? Or is it what we see part of a master plan created by a master planner who wants to receive the worship of the world? 2 Corinthians 11, 14 tells us that Satan changes himself into an angel of what? Light. Therefore, it's no wonder if his ministers change themselves into ministers of righteousness. Satan doesn't just fight against the church. He joins it. Revelation 16, 13 tells us there are unclean spirits like frogs that come out of the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the false prophet, the mouth of the beast. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them together. Demons working miracles to deceive people on the earth concerning what? Worship. First Peter warns us, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Satan first tries to deceive, and those he can't deceive, he then persecutes. During the Dark Ages, people were told to recant, change their position, turn away from the Word of God, and just follow what the world church was teaching. And, if, and they said, we'll give you money, we'll give you position, we'll give you power. And they said, no, we got to go by what the Word of God says. They said, okay, we'll kill you then. That's the devil working. John 8, 44 states that Satan is a liar and the father of it. But the Bible says to the law and to the testimony, if they don't speak according to this word, there is no what? Light, truth in them. Isaiah 8.20, sanctify them through the truth, thy word is what? Truth, John 17.17. 17. We are to teach just every teaching of every church by what the Bible teaches. There's something going on behind the scenes. In Revelation, the Bible says a beast emerges and it's given power by the dragon or Satan. In Revelation, Satan works through this beast. And we're going to identify this beast pretty soon and later on in the seminar so that he can receive the worship of people like you and me who ought to only be worshiping God. In heaven, Satan wanted worship, but he wasn't successful other than deceiving one third of the angels, which is pretty impressive. So he came down here to the earth and led Adam and Eve into sin. And then later he came to this world with a special temptation. Following his baptism, Jesus went off in the wilderness to fast and pray and prepare for his earthly ministry. You know, he was baptized, the Bible says, when he was about 30 years old. Why? Because in the Jewish economy, a rabbi had to be 30 years of age. He went six weeks without food and was no doubt hungry. Can you go six weeks without food? Oh. That's Jesus getting the victory over appetite for us, you know, by the way. Then the devil came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, why don't you command these stones and be turned to bread? Of course this is a real temptation. Could Jesus have turned those stones to bread? Yeah. You know how you feel if you miss one meal. And here's the devil saying, Look at all these stones. Turn these stones into bread. There are two important things to note here. Number one, Jesus was being tempted to use his miracle-working power to benefit himself. 
And further, Satan was tempting him to doubt his father. He said, if you are the Son of God. He was tempting Jesus to doubt himself. Have you ever doubted yourself before? Have you ever doubted your relationship with, your, with God? Jesus' response is an example to us. He answered by saying, it is written. Now, you know, the devil used Scripture to tempt him. But Jesus used Scripture back. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out uh, from the mouth of God. Jesus appealed to the word of God, and he was triumphant in that temptation. So Satan tried again. He said, he took Jesus up to a high place and said, throw yourself down, because I know it says in the 91st Psalm that the angels would catch you before you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus answered by saying, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. I'm a Christian. Satan can't hurt me. The world can't hurt me. I'm going to go up on the roof and jump off. What would you think of that person? Huh? Pretty stupid, right? <laughs> Don't tempt the Lord your God. So Satan tried again. Jesus, he said, I will give you the kings of the world on one condition. If you bow down and what? Worship me. Wow, there it is. There is Satan seeking for worship, not from the angels only, not from fallen humanity, but from Jesus himself. God manifested in the flesh, the one who created all things. And Jesus responded, get thee hence, Satan was turned back, defeated. This illustrates just what it is that motivates the devil. He's after the worship of the world, but we can meet his temptations by the word of God. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, you shall worship the Lord your God, and only him shall you worship. The weakest, trembling sinner armed with the promises of God is in a position of far greater strength than all the powers of hell. As the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. The devil even tried to get Jesus to worship him. Ezekiel wrote about Satan in Ezekiel 28 when he said, You are the anointed cherub who covers. Satan was anointed to be one of the covering archangels. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created. Satan was created by God as what? Perfect. Till iniquity was found in you. God didn't give him iniquity. He became a sinner. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Now some translations say, I have destroyed you, but Satan's not dead yet, is he? He's alive and well, but he will be destroyed in the last day. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. In other words, he fell in love with himself. Satan was filled with self-interest and self-centeredness. He wanted to elevate himself and receive worship. And as a result of his sin and the human family's participation in sin, he led Adam and Eve to sin. And because of that, he has control of the whole world. We live in a world filled with crime and violence, with sin and misery. Tornadoes tear through towns and trailer parks. That's Satan's doing. A child is born HIV positive, or a tsunami sweeps through a village and leaves death behind, and people say, where was your God? Couldn't God have prevented that? God gets blamed for what the devil causes. When the former CEO of Apple, the late Steve Jobs, was 13 years old, he brought a magazine to church and showed his pastor. On the front cover was a picture of starving children on Biafra, which is we now call Nigeria, he said to the pastor, does God know stuff before it happens? The pastor said, yes, he knows. Did he know about this? The pastor said, Steve, it's hard to understand. I know. But yes, God knows all about it. Steve Jobs said, I don't want to worship a God who would allow these things to happen. But wait, is this God's fault? There's a story in the Bible about a man that had a field of wheat and somebody came and planted weeds in his field. This could, could have caused the man financial ruin. When somebody said, who did this? The man said, an enemy has done this. 
Look around, friends. Emergency rooms are filling up because an enemy has done this. People are dying prematurely because an enemy has done this. A drunk driver runs a red light, innocent people die. Was that God's doing? No, an enemy has done this. God is love. He wants his people to be secure, saved, and well. So why doesn't God stop the suffering? Why does he allow it? Why do innocent people die? When Lucifer started rebelling against God in heaven, what options did God have? Think about it. God could do anything he wanted to, right? Could God have destroyed Lucifer right then? Stopped it right before it even got started? Yeah. But what if he had? Think about it. Being in heaven when an angel arrived and said, Lucifer said that God is unfair and shares what Lucifer has been saying about God. Lucifer's whisper campaign, the one that resulted in a third of the angels turning against God. Now imagine another angel arriving and announcing that God had destroyed Lucifer. Okay, Lucifer said God was unfair. God destroys him. Can you imagine what that would have done to heaven, to the universe, if God had wiped out Lucifer right then? Would anybody ever trust God again? Think about it. God had given angels freedom of choice. He took a risk when he did that because there was always a chance they might use that freedom of choice unwisely. And that's what Lucifer did. He used his freedom of choice selfishly. God did the same when he created human beings. He took a risk and gave us freedom of choice. Freedom to worship him or not to. Freedom to obey him or not to. Freedom of choice. True love does not force. It's based on freedom and choice. It worked perfectly well to begin with. Adam and Eve were blissfully happy in the Garden of Eden until the devil came along. And when they were tempted, they exercised the freedom of choice in an irresponsible way. Satan lied to them. You don't have to obey God, he says. God said, don't eat it. Go ahead and eat it. You will not die. You will be like God's. God is holding something back from you. They bought the lie. At least she did and ate the fruit. And so today the battle rages. Cain and Abel, their children, both worshiped God. Both knew God, both brought sacrifices to God, but Cain did it his own way. Cain was chastised by God and killed his brother. So he was cast out of the garden. But Cain didn't stop worshiping God. He just did it his own way. And there, all the way back in the Garden of Eden, is where the first false worship began in the world. And who is being worshipped if it isn't done according to God's way? Satan. He's the one that said, do it my way. Don't do it God's way. God said, don't eat it. Go ahead and eat it. And God gets the blame for sin and rebellion. Why didn't God stop Adam and Eve from using their freedom of choice how they wanted to? To remove their freedom of choice would have made robots out of Adam and Eve. How appropriate. Ahead of time. Stay away from that tree. But what about all the suffering that resulted? Remember this. No one has suffered more than God because of what sin has done. It cost him the life of his sinless son. God looked down through the years and knew that if he was going to create human beings, they wouldn't be happy without freedom of choice. And although sin has damaged the world and caused suffering and sadness, we are still free to use our choice to honor and serve God and receive everlasting life. Many do not choose wisely, and their behavior is causing all the evil in the world today. You know, some of the wildest people that I've talked to and met had very strict parents, maybe too strict. They weren't given freedom of choice. They weren't given choices. They were told what to do, how to do it, what not to do. And when they got freedom, got away from the house, they made poor choices because they wanted that freedom to disobey. Because they felt they didn't have any choice before. And now, because they have choice, they chose the things which they were told not to choose.
In fact, sin is the result of squandering the gift of choice and should show us how important it is to be connected with God. What we've got today in the world is people with freedom of choice who have not surrendered that choice to Jesus. In Job 1, it states that there was a day when the sons of God came before God and Satan was with them. God asked Satan where he had come from. Where did you come from? Well, remember, Adam was the what? Son of God. Right? Romans 3.31. Adam was the son of God, ruler of this planet. But because he failed, Satan claimed it as his. So the sons of God that came before God and Satan was with them must have been rulers of other worlds that have not fallen because the Bible says God never called any angel a son of God. So these are not angels that, that Satan came with. These are sons of God that he came with. And Satan claimed the earth as his. Satan said he was walking back and forth across the earth. It's mine. I own it. Most people on the earth are on Satan's side. They don't want God. They want His rules. They don't want His love. They want to live their own way and worship the way they want to, not how God has commanded them. And Satan is angry with God's people. And the dragon was enraged with a woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, Revelation 12, 17. Revelation 19.10 tells us what the testimony of Jesus is. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Satan hates those who are obedient to God. He hates the commandments and he hates prophecy. It reveals the truth and exposes falsehood and lies that lead people away from the worship of the Creator and Redeemer and into worshiping things and self and other people and ultimately Satan. For the battle is not against people, like Shakespeare of Spears said, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. Ephesians 6.12 states, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, as other people, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. It's against wicked spirits or spiritual wickedness in high places, demons and their influence on us and worship. Satan's biggest success is getting people to think he does not exist. God told the serpent in the Garden of Eden after he had caused Adam and Eve to sin, you shall bruise his heel and he shall crush your head. Wicked spirits in high places seems impossible to overcome, but Jesus wins the war. But the battle goes on for every soul. Every time I have a series of meetings, things happen. People get sick and can't come. People get emergencies and can't come to the meetings. It's too hot. It's too cold. It's too far. Relatives come to visit. Distractions is the name of the game. He shall bruise his head, and he shall bruise your heel. This is a, I saw a statue in the Philippines a few years back, and my wife's cousin owned an antique shop, and I saw it there, and I tried to buy it from them, and they refused to sell it to me. They just they wanted to hold on to it. So my wife got a hold of uh, another friend in the Philippines, and they carved this out of wood for me. Isn't that amazing? So Satan's got his little spear there, going to hit Christ's heel, and Christ is ready to... Who's his head? Here's a gourd that Tammy made me in a snake with eyes and tail over in Belgrade. Markings on the gourd is Genesis chapter 3, written around the body of the serpent. That's a gourd. And she painted it. She put eyes on it. She put a tongue on it. Well, that's part of the gourd, actually. And, and then she put Genesis chapter 3 all the way around that gourd. Isn't that amazing? In God is life. It's a lot like saying that if you plug in a lamp and turn on the light, you'll get light. That's what it's like to be connected with God. But when you choose to pull the plug, the light stops shining. That's not God's fault. Many people walk in darkness because they are not connected to the light. And their worship is to the prince of darkness. What sin does is it separates people from God. And God is a source of life. We end up walking in darkness. You know, Satan was very smart. We turn from God, we sin, we're lost. And we're in the same situation as he's in. You know, like the guy that kills 12 people and then commits suicide. That's what Satan is doing. He knows he's going to die, but he wants to take as many people with him as he can before he does. Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God. 
and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Did God take a risk in giving the human family freedom of choice? Yes, he did. A huge risk. And who risked the most? God did. Because he knew that if humanity sinned, God would send his son Jesus to come and pay the penalty for sin. But God did it. You think this was just a simple sacrifice? Can you imagine being pure spirit, God in heaven, and say, oh, all these people need salvation. So I'm going to come down to the earth. I'm going to be born in human flesh. I'm going to live a perfect life in human flesh for 33 years. And then I'm going to go to the cross and die in the flesh. And then I'm going to go back to heaven as pure spirit. And we'll see you later. And that's not what happened. When Jesus arose from the dead, what did he tell Doubting Thomas? Put the fist in your side and put your fingers in the holes in my hands, for, for a spirit does not have flesh and bone as you see me have. When Jesus was raised, he was raised bodily. When he went back to heaven, he went back with a human body forever to be associated with humanity. And that's why he said, it's expedient for you that I go away, for if I don't go away, I won't, the spirit won't come to you. Why? Because Jesus can be in one place at one time, just like you and me. But the Holy Spirit can be here. He can be in California. He can be in the Middle East. He can be in Russia, China, all at the same time. Because God is a spirit. But Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. And so he has a human body. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That was a sacrifice. Not just a division throughout eternity. The enemy of souls wants to convince you that God is unfair and unjust. There's a battle raging. Behind the scenes, a master planner knows that if he can separate you from God, that this life is all you'll have. You know, praise God for that. Even if a person doesn't accept Jesus... They can thank God, even if they don't believe in Him, that they have this life. Because this life isn't guaranteed. God gives it to us anyway, and then He gives us free choice. And people sometimes choose the wrong way, but He still allows them to live. And we say, why? And he knows he is fighting a losing battle because like many he has inspired before, he wants to take as many with him as possible before he is destroyed. Ezekiel 28, 19 states, You have become a terror and shall be no more, how long? Forever. Satan is going to be destroyed. The Bible says Jesus will one day come back to the world and those who trust him will be saved. The Bible can be trusted. Therefore, God can be trusted. And we can believe his message to us that the best is still yet to come. We can be part of that kingdom that will never end, the kingdom of a God who can be trusted. In fact, Jesus spells out the problem of the masses today when he says, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. John 5, 4. Jesus knocks at the door of your heart tonight, waiting for you to let him into your, live his life in you. He'll keep you connected to him. He will love you and never let you go. Can you allow Jesus in your life tonight to bless you with his presence and keep you as his own? It won't be long. Jesus will return. In this world of sin, while a spiritual battle rages on, you can know Something happened. Okay. You can know the peace of heaven and the certainty of salvation. And that's only through Jesus. Amen? Let me pray with you tonight. Father in heaven, thank you for your great goodness towards a rebellious race. Bless us sinners with the gift of your son, Jesus, and make our hearts truly your own. We know Jesus will soon return, take our will, our freedom of choice, and give us grace to choose you always. I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, if you have any questions, please leave them in the question box on the table on the floor, and I'll try to answer them. What's today, Monday? Wednesday night. No, no meeting tomorrow night. Those watching online can email me your questions at mfracker at charter.net. And if you want any of those books or um, DVDs that I mentioned, uh, email me again uh, online or let me know you're watching, and uh, we'll try and get those out to you as well. Uh, Wednesday night, we're going to cover seven eyes and seven horns found in Revelation. And then Friday night, evolution or creation. And then Saturday morning at 11 o'clock, what is faith? And Saturday night at 7 o'clock, the ghost in the attic. May God bless and keep you and may his face shine upon you. Go in peace and safety.